The next two lectures address one of the great American pastimes, suing the government. This is an area of law that is deeply convoluted, in part because the Supreme Court's composition has shifted over time, and in part because the relevant statutes are products of legislative compromise. In these two lectures, I'm going to do my best to provide you with a high-level roadmap for litigating surveillance practices. There are three topics on deck for this lecture. First, we will discuss the basic components of a private civil claim. Second, we will explore standing. It's an often misunderstood constitutional doctrine that functions as a gatekeeper for the courts. Third, we'll work through the mechanics of statutory claims, that is, lawsuits authorized by a statute. Let's begin with the components of a claim. And I'd like to open with a suggestion. Don't rely on your intuition in this area of law. It's remarkably easy to forget a tiny detail, and that tiny detail can totally flip the outcome of a case. I would strongly recommend that before passing judgment on whether any claim is likely to succeed, you work entirely through the analysis for that claim. There are four components of civil claims that I would like to focus on. The first up is standing. It's a constitutional doctrine that determines who can sue. More on that soon. The second component is a cause of action. It's a basis for legal liability. Some causes of action apply to individual government officers, and others apply to government agencies. In this course, the two common sources for a cause of action are the Constitution and statutes. Here especially, details can be very tricky, and it's critical to identify and check off all the elements of a cause of action. If even just one element is missing, say, particular surveillance was accidental instead of knowing, then there is no good legal claim. Affirmative defenses are exceptions from legal liability. The defendant is arguing that even if he or she satisfied all the elements of a cause of action, and otherwise would be totally on the hook, there is a separate bar to liability. In this course, Defenses are a lot like causes of action. Their sources are primarily the Constitution and statutes. And, just like causes of action, you have to carefully work through all the elements before concluding that a defense is viable. One of the most important defenses in surveillance law is sovereign immunity. We'll discuss it further in the next lecture. Another key affirmative defense, which comes up in slightly different forms, is good faith. The idea is that where a government employee has made an understandable mistake, or the law wasn't clear, then they should not be subject to liability. Remedies are the end goals of a civil claim. They are, crassly, what the plaintiff can get. One common remedy is just money. In law speak, that's called damages. Ordinarily, Damages are used to compensate a plaintiff. Those are called compensatory or actual damages. Sometimes bonus damages are available to punish egregious misconduct. Those are called punitive damages. Another frequent remedy, and one particularly important in surveillance, is an injunction. That's a binding court order to either do something or to stop doing something. Declaratory relief is another remedy you will encounter. That's a judicial statement of legal rights. Since a declaratory judgment against a surveillance practice does not have any force of its own, it is usually paired with an injunction that prohibits the practice. Taken together, injunctive and declaratory relief are often called prospective relief, the idea being that they're forward-looking remedies. There's one final remedy I'd like to cover. Some causes of action entitle a prevailing plaintiff to attorney fees and litigation costs. In the American legal system, ordinarily each side pays the price of a lawsuit. Since lawyers can be exorbitantly expensive, fee shifting often plays a substantial role in litigation decisions. Okay, 
So that's the basic structure of a civil claim. Now let's talk about constitutional standing. The standing doctrine arises from Article 3 of the Constitution, which sets out the powers of the federal judiciary. As interpreted by the Supreme Court, only certain disputes qualify as a case or controversy that a federal court can hear. The textbook version of standing doctrine has three components. The plaintiff must have suffered an injury in fact. That injury must be actual or imminent, and it must be concrete and particularized. If those sound like vague legal standards, well, that's because they are. Litigants and judges, and even justices of the Supreme Court, sharply disagree on what qualifies. The second component of standing is causation. The injury has to be fairly traceable to the defendant's misconduct. Causation usually isn't much of an issue in surveillance law, since claims are about an invasion of security or privacy directly by a government agent. The last component of standing is redressability. That is, if a plaintiff wins, it has to be likely that remedies would redress the injury. This also isn't too much of a factor in surveillance law, since plaintiffs usually seek a well-established remedy. So, the punchline is, surveillance standing issues are almost always about the injury requirement. The easy cases are where a plaintiff has actually been snooped on. Courts agree that if a plaintiff can point to actual surveillance against themselves, then there is standing. The hard cases arise where a plaintiff is uncertain whether he or she was or will be surveilled. For example, the plaintiff might be challenging a particular surveillance program that collects information from people like the plaintiff, but the plaintiff can't show that he or she was or will be actually impacted by the program. The Supreme Court recently addressed that very set of facts. In Clapper against Amnesty International USA, defense attorneys and civil society groups challenged the National Security Agency's surveillance practices under Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. We'll discuss Section 702 in some detail later in the course. The plaintiffs argued that they were in contact with foreign individuals who were likely targets of NSA surveillance and they, therefore, were likely impacted by the NSA. Splitting five to four, the Supreme Court held that there was not standing. There are a number of moving parts to the Clapper opinion, so it's difficult to pinpoint exactly how a future case would be resolved. At least this much is clear. The Supreme Court wants a fair degree of certainty before a court hears a surveillance challenge. A plaintiff must be able to show that they themselves are likely impacted by surveillance. And while a plaintiff may have serious concerns about surveillance, and may have taken substantial precautions because of surveillance, those are not sufficient to establish standing. The other standing case you should be aware of is City of Los Angeles against Lyons. In that case, an Angelino driver was pulled over and put in a dangerous chokehold. He sued for both damages and prospective relief, limiting LAPD use of chokeholds. The Supreme Court noted that Lyons undoubtedly had standing to sue for damages. He was physically injured, after all. That said, the court held that prospective relief requires an independent and prospective standing analysis. Since Lyons could not show that he himself was likely to be put in a chokehold again, he did not have standing for prospective relief. The takeaway from Lyons, for our purposes, is that past surveillance is not enough to have standing for prospective relief. The plaintiffs themselves must likely be subject to surveillance again in the future. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Self, doesn't this mean that sometimes nobody will have standing to stop a surveillance program? Aren't there targeted surveillance programs where individuals probably won't be affected more than once? Yes, absolutely. One of the key impacts of Lyons is that targeted surveillance programs may be immune from prospective judicial relief. 
plaintiffs may only be able to collect money damages. Okay, on that slightly dispiriting note, enough about standing. Let's turn to a cheerier topic and the final subject of this lecture, statutory claims. The idea here is straightforward. Statutes can set out the elements of legal claims, the defenses to those claims, and the types of relief that are available. I've prepared a table of several federal causes of action that are available against government surveillance. I certainly don't expect you to memorize the details. My hope is that you'll take away two observations. First, they're pretty good causes of action available against government surveillance. Especially in conventional law enforcement scenarios, plaintiffs can hit hard. Second, the details are all over the place. The only way to get this right is to sit down with the statutes and work your way through them. Let me say a few words about the Administrative Procedure Act. The APA provides a basic structure for federal agency operations. It also provides a special cause of action for challenging federal agency conduct. Just to be clear, this Section 702 is entirely different from Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. The APA's cause of action functions as a catch-all for agency legal violations. That's especially important in surveillance since some statutes that authorize surveillance do not provide a cause of action for challenging that surveillance. Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act, for example, is currently being litigated under APA Section 702. There are two important limitations on the APA cause of action. First, it only provides prospective remedies. A plaintiff cannot recover damages under Section 702. Also, courts sometimes find that the APA cause of action is implicitly unavailable where a statute has provided some other mechanism for agency review. There is one other catch-all federal cause of action that I would like to highlight, and it's the last topic for this lecture. It's the Federal Tort Claims Act, or FTCA. A tort, in law, has nothing to do with baked goods. It's simply an injury claim, ranging from personal injury to economic injury to even privacy injury. Torts are generally a matter of state law, so this is a unique circumstance where the federal government has voluntarily subjected itself to damages liability under state law. The FTCA establishes federal liability for torts committed by federal employees. It's a waiver of sovereign immunity, so plaintiff actually sues the United States itself and can win damages from the United States itself. There are two important exceptions to the FTCA for our purposes. First, so-called discretionary functions are exempt from liability. That means a plaintiff cannot use the FTCA to challenge a particular surveillance policy. A plaintiff can, though, still challenge a particular instance of surveillance. Second, the FTCA expressly accepts some intentional torts, including intentional physical injuries and defamation. The FTCA does not, however, accept intentional privacy torts. For our purposes, a plaintiff can generally use the intentional privacy tort of intrusion upon seclusion to challenge surveillance practices. The law that applies to government intrusion claims is quite similar to the Fourth Amendment. So when we discuss Fourth Amendment violations, keep in mind that an FTCA claim might be available. All right, that's it for statutory claims. In the next lecture, we're going to take up constitutional issues.